Okay. Well, good morning. Thank you. Mike Morris. I'm from Brook Army Medical Center. As I was introduced, um, I was given 10 minutes to talk about Stampede. Um, wow. I could talk for hours on Stampede, but I'm going to try to bring to you all the studies that we've done in very short fashion that look at the depth and breadth of pulmonary diseases that we've identified uh, through our active duty population. So if you can go to the next one. Um, so I am here on behalf of the DOD, and these are my views and not those of the DOD. Go ahead. Oh. Oh. Is it working now? Okay. Whoops. Let me go back. Okay. So the first one I want to talk about briefly is acute eosinophilic pneumonia. This was first reported back in 2003 um, by, by Andy Shore et al. when we first recognized this. So this is a group of uh, patients. Or actually, I'm sorry. These are all the studies I'm going to talk about. Let me, um, so I'm going to go through them briefly. Anyway, uh, the AEP study, uh, this is a, a paper we put out a couple years ago. It started back in 2003. And this is a group of 43 active duty service members. Um, about 91% of them had uh, a new smoking history. 77% had recently increased. Predominantly male. Uh, all were, um, were hypoxic. Majority had mechanical ventilation. Uh, and what we found in this retrospective study is that it was a, it's one of the bigger clusters of AEP that we have seen uh, throughout the literature. And just sort of point out, this was probably the first thing that we noticed in theater, and it ultimately changed the way we did things at Longstool in terms of looking for this disease process first in the non-traumatic population. Um, so we've, we've also looked at COPD. Um, so this is a study we published back in 2016. Um, I'm, I'm just going to give you very, very brief overviews of this. Um, but what we looked at was to try to find differences be between deployers and non-deployers. Uh, granted, the data was early. Uh, we got the data from about 2005 to 2010. And what we were not able to do was to find any differences in PFT values in deployers versus non-deployers, suggesting there was a greater risk in, in that population. Now, granted, it's a small, small population. Um, we did see a little bit difference in DLCO, uh, but it was a little bit higher uh, in the, in the uh, deployed population. But really, uh, that's the only thing that even came close to significance. And working with the, um, uh, the Public Health Command and epidemiologically, we looked at rates of emphysema and chronic airway obstruction per ICD-9 codes within ALTA and found that they remained relatively flat throughout the, pop throughout the period that we studied. And we did not see a spike or increase, and this is uh, up to 2009 when, the you know, when we had deployed the majority of our folks over to uh, Southwest Asia. Um, we also went back and looked at asthma. This is a bigger group. These were all patients that um, had were undergoing a medical evaluation board, i.e. they were not fit for, or undergoing an evaluation to determine fitness for duty uh, to, to remain in the military. So these would, rec we would suggest that these are patients that are, have, uh, that are more symptomatic and having more problems with meeting the, the fitness standards that are set up by the Army. Um, so if you can look there, we didn't really see a big difference uh, when we looked at deployers versus non-deployers. We didn't see a big difference. Uh, between the two populations. And when we looked at those that had a pre-deployment versus a post-deployment diagnosis, uh, we didn't see a difference in those as well. Uh, when we looked at severity of disease, and this is solely based on what was recorded in the chart, um, we only had spirometry for about 80 percent of the population, although they all are required to have spirometry before an MEB. We can only find it in 80 percent. And then just looking at how they were diagnosed and how they were assessed in terms of uh, asthma severity, we didn't see a difference between the groups as well. So, so mild, moderate, severe, and then those with exercise-induced symptoms uh, remained a f relatively even population across the board. Um, oops. Um, and then there's another study that I didn't publish, um, but it published out of Public Health Command looking at the rates of asthma or obstructive lung disease. Uh, across the spectrum uh, from about 2005, 2015, and found that to be relatively flat as well. Um, so we also looked at sarcoid. This paper has not been published yet. It's been accepted to military medicine. And once again, we went back and looked at, at patients with sarcoid, some who underwent a medical evaluation board, some we found uh, through chart review, uh, div divided them up based on deployment history, and once again, didn't see a difference in the severity of sarcoid as uh, determined by uh, radiographic staging and, and other factors uh, within this group and, and found that they uh, uh, were 
pretty even across the board, regardless of deployment history. And once again, working with Joe Abraham at Public Health Command, um, he got us the data looking at the years 2005 to 2010 and, and looked at uh, rates in pulmonary sarcoid diagnosis across the DOD and once again found that they remained relatively constant throughout the, the, the time frame that we looked at. Okay, so Stampede 1 um, uh, it was our first study. We published this back in 2014. Uh, first study to look at acute effects of deployment. So we took a group of patients with new onset dyspnea and they had to be evaluated within six months of redeployment. Um, did a limited evaluation in terms of what you see up there, uh, PFTs, chest x-ray, high-res CT, uh, methacholine, and then other, other studies as clinically indicated. And really we were looking for, did we, were we missing something in terms of acute or subacute interstitial lung disease? Um, and this gives you basically the deployment to history in terms of exposures, and you can see that most people had significant exposure to dust and sand, uh, burn pits as well, and then less or so vehicle exhaust or smoke or fires from other, from other things burning over there. Um, and this also points out the severity of what they felt. This is self-reported data of, of how severe the exposure was. So, so ultimately, without going into all the details of Stampede, uh, Stampede 1, um, this is, these were the final diagnoses that we came up with based on their evaluation. So 14 of them through, through the evaluation had, didn't have a specific diagnosis. Uh, they had symptoms, they were short of breath and they ran, but we did not have a specific etiology. Uh, the biggest group was the group of airway hyperreactivity and asthma, which accounted for about 42% of the population um, and uh, was the most predominant finding in, in, that, in that group of patients that we looked at. Uh, and then you can see the other categories up there. So a few with an abnormal cell count on BAL uh, without any other findings, a few with, uh, with uh, reflux and then a, a variety of other diagnoses. Okay. Um, so uh, one of the things that we did notice with this population is that were a fair number of patients that had sleep disorders and mental health disorders that, that ran the gamut of all these different diagnoses and were not particular to a single diagnosis. But we did not find any diffuse lung disease, at least in this population of, of, of folks that we studied, um, and didn't find any, and there were no findings on high res CT as well. So moving on to uh, Stampede 3, uh, Stampede 3 we started right after we finished Stampede 1 and this was to look at the uh, individuals with chronic symptoms. So uh, the only criteria for enrolling is that they had chronic symptoms relating back to deployment, um, able to exercise and we did a more standardized, more thorough evaluation and you can see all the tests that we did up there um, on all these patients. Now this data, um, the initial paper uh, is in review by CHEST right now. We're, in, we're, we're doing revisions. It, is not, it has not been published yet. Um, so after going through all these studies and, and, and looking at these different things, we came up with these diagnostic categories. Um, uh, you can see them listed up there. So dyspnea accounted for, so those were patients that we did not have any specific etiology for, normal PFTs, normal bronchoprovocation testing, um, normal CT as well. Uh, asthma accounted probably for the biggest group of patients that we saw, uh, those with baseline obstruction and, and some type of airway hyperreactivity. We saw a fair number that just had airway hyperreactivity that we could only detect on some type of bronchoprovocation test. Uh, a number with l airway disorders to include uh, a large airway collapse and laryngeal collapse. Um, and then, uh, as you can see, the other groups, uh, nonspecific PATs where they had an isolated defect but no other no other findings, and then those with diffuse lung disease only accounted for about uh, about a two percent of the population. Only six patients had findings on high res CT that suggested some type of uh, diffuse lung disease. Okay. Um, these are the exposures. Once again, this is very similar to what they reported in Stampede One. Uh, very frequent exposures to dust and sand, burn pits, vehicle exhaust, and smoke and fumes and the severity is, uh, ranks up there as I showed in the Stampede 1 data. Um, the other thing we noticed with this population is, is looking through um, with all the testing is that there are a fair number of uh, comorbidities. So you can see the numbers for uh, smoking in this population, uh, which is about 36% of the population uh, that reported it. Uh, GERD was 14%. Uh, those that had allergic rhinitis or poly positive allergy testing was fairly high at 44%. Uh, LSA was 40, 
And then those with mental health disorders was about 51% of the population. And then the other thing you can point out from that is that a lot of these, a lot of these patients um, did have an elevated BMI, and this is greater than 30 kilograms per meter square as well. But there was no significant difference between the groups. Uh, just these are the comorbidities that we found in this population. So what we came up with a conclusion in is that with Stampede 3, and that is just a bit of the data from Stampede 3, I only got 10 minutes, uh, that symptoms are very complex and maybe multifactorial. Uh, they're not one specific issue. Um, a large percentage of our patients did not have findings of lung disease based on imaging and PFTs, although they were symptomatic and they were having problems primarily with this population with exercising. They didn't, there were very few patients that only had rest, rest symptoms, but this was all, I can't pass my PT test, I can't run anymore. Um, diffuse lung disease was, was very uncommon in this population. Uh, we look carefully at that. And, and most of the clinical evaluation moving forward should focus initially on asthma, airway hyperreactivity, and then upper airway disorders such as um, vocal cord dysfunction and excessive dynamic airway collapse. So that is Stampede 1, 2, no, well, not 2, I'll talk about 2 later and 3 and our other studies in a nutshell, so. Okay. Thank you. Uh, very, uh, uh, very helpful presentation. Um, any, from the committee, any uh, specific clarifying types of, of questions? Yeah, I have a, just a. Uh, Dr. Spicer. Yeah, I, I'm afraid I missed what the source of these patients were. You said new onset dyspnea, but where, what was the population base they came from? This was, this was all active duty, so we're limited to evaluating active duty service members. Uh, primarily, they came from our geographic location in San Antonio. They were also referred from other bases, uh, Fort Hood, Fort Polk, Fort Sill. And then we also, part of the evaluation, about 100 of the patients got evaluated up at Walter Reed. So we did most of them at Brook, a lot of them at Walter Reed. And they were referred from all over the DOD, but limited to uh, those that were active duty. We didn't have a way for, to pay for VA patients, so we're not allowed to see VA patients within our population yet, sort of. So they came to the hospital on their own, were diagnosed as new onset dyspnea? Um, yes. So they, they either were referred from primary care, uh, they were referred from other pulmonologists at other uh, centers, um, or we had advertised about the study as well and they signed up on their own. A quick question on Stampede 3, uh, whether it be airway hyperreactivity or interstitial lung disease, did, did you have baseline information that said they didn't have these issues prior to uh, deployment? Um, uh, objectively, no, but one of the criteria was that this had to be new onset before we enrolled them so that people that had documented history of any cardiac or pulmonary, documented history of pulmonary or cardiac disease prior to deployment, we did not include. Now, if you look through the charts, there's a lot of people that we have found uh, that have a lot of symptoms, never got evaluated, but if, if they hadn't been evaluated before, we included them. But if it was documented asthma, for instance, we did not include them in the study. But if they had symptoms prior to deployment and didn't have a specific diagnosis, they weren't? Um, we, we, we teased that out when we first saw them. What we were looking for specifically, those people that could say, I started having symptoms when I deployed or shortly thereafter from returning from deployment. Um, if you talk to the, uh, the, uh, the folks that deploy, a lot of them do have, and I think some of the studies have shown this, a lot of upper respiratory illnesses, uh, you know, non-specific cough, things like that while they're deployed. So we were looking for the ones that continue to have symptoms after they deployed. Any other burning question? Um, the participants underwent methacholine and cardiopulmonary exercise testing. And yes. So forth. Is that fairly complete on most of the participants? Yes. Yeah, so we did use the methacholine to make a decision on the diagnosis. We did not use the CPET for the data that you have up there. So because there's, uh, as you know, there's a lot of discussion and how good is CPET to identify lung disease and. And in, the, in a healthy group of people, it's, it's fairly difficult. So we did not include the, the data that we submitted to CHEST, and we did not make any diagnosis solely based on the CPET data. And we'll put that out later once we have all that together. But we have about, this group was about 380 patients that we had. 
it, you, had, you had indicated that um, you included folks who had symptoms shortly after deployment. Was there a time frame that you were looking for where symptoms arose after deployment? It was, it was, up, it was up to about six months in, in time frame. So those that sort of uh, that, that indicated that I came back and wasn't feeling well, wasn't feeling normal, was having problems, you know, up to six months, in, you know, so trying to include that population as well. So if they clearly had, oh, I deployed and five years later I got symptoms, we did not study that population. How would you define diffuse lung disease? Um, on the, primarily on the basis of their imaging. So if they had, if they had Im for that population, for those six, those if they had imaging findings suggesting of, of bilateral infiltrates, and there was a variety of diagnoses associated with those. Well, thank you. We'll be talking more with you during the uh, panel discussion, uh, but uh, appreciate uh, Okay. Your thank you very much.